I am Kirk Jowers and welcome to the April 3rd Frequently Asked Questions episode. As always, I'm joined by Dr. Russell Osgathorpe, the Chief Medical Officer of doTERRA and a board certified pediatric infectious diseases specialist. Thank you for watching, commenting, and asking questions. And today's questions focus around people who test positive for COVID-19. So first, uh, the question is, will we all get COVID-19 eventually, or are there some of us that will never get it? Great question. Um, you're asking me to guess. Yes. Right? Um, so uh, we don't know truthfully the answer. With other respiratory viral pandemics that we've had, it has, those viruses have circulated for 10 years. Uh, most recently, 2009 H1N1, um, it took a long time for that virus to kind of completely fade away. The answer to that is based in, some, in a concept called herd immunity. So most people have heard of herd immunity. <laughs> right. And so herd immunity is the proportion of a particular population that have seen a particular disease and are now therefore immune. As time goes on, as the herd gets more and more immune, we'll see flattening of curves. What, what I think will happen with this disease, and many others in my field feel the same, is, is that we'll have peaks of illness that get progressively smaller as the herd gets more and more immune over time. And so will everybody on earth get COVID-19? No, probably not, because the virus will just stop circulating after the R naught falls to below zero because most of the herd is immune. So once dead end transmission events are the rule, we will see the virus fade away into the background. Not everybody on earth will have been infected, but enough of the herd will have been infected that we won't see transmission. Second, what happens to people who test positive for COVID-19 specifically? Are they sent home to self-isolate mm -hmm. there or are they kept at a hospital? Okay, so this is a great question. Many people are worried about what happens if they test positive. So if somebody tests positive for COVID-19, if they have severe symptoms that require hospitalization, they'll be hospitalized. If they have moderate to mild symptoms that would allow them to be managed at home, they'll be managed at home and told to isolate at home. So it depends on the severity of your illness. And I guess it could also depend on the availability of, of, uh, yeah. of healthcare resources and Absolutely. hospitals. So in parts of the world where COVID-19 has you stretched- You gave the ideal answer. <laughs> yeah. In parts of the world where, the, where, it's, where hospital resources have been stretched to the limit, we've had to get very creative at how we care for cases with COVID, which is why we want to flatten that curve so desperately so that our ICU beds are available when people need them and our hospital beds are available when people need them. And this, this sounds like a, you know, a teenager would you rather game, but okay. <laughs> if you are sent home, should you clear out the, at the house for at least five days so the rest of the household does not get infected or should you quarantine the household in the house so they do not infect everyone else? So I guess okay. shoot everyone away from the infected person or bring them in yeah. close. The last thing I would recommend doing is shooting everybody away. Okay. Because if one person in a household is sick, it's likely that others have been exposed. And so if we shoot them all away, all we do is spread the virus. Right. So if somebody is positive in home, at home, they should be cared for at home Family members who've been living with that individual for a time should also stay at home and self-isolate because they've been exposed. And that person ideally will be cared for in a part of the house that is separated from the rest of the folks in the house, if it's possible. So that ideally the person who is positive would have their own bedroom and their own bathroom. And if the house doesn't accommodate that kind of ideal situation? Um, then you would try as best you can to create a space within your house that is partitioned off for the individual um, so that everybody in the house knows that they need to stay six feet away to decrease the likelihood that the virus will be transmitted from their loved one to their family member. And then the person who is positive should wear a mask whenever possible so that the virus that leaves the person's nose or mouth through breathing, coughing, sneezing, is caught by that mask rather than entering the air and potentially being spread to family members. Um, 
anybody who's caring for that individual, let's say that the person is really sick and you have to deliver them food or you have to clean their bedding or their clothing, needs to be wearing a mask as well, I would recommend, and gloves when possible when handling that and using very strict hand hygiene. So hand washing or hand sanitizing. Finally, how accurate are the confirmed cases and fatality numbers that I read off on our episodes, not the FAQ episodes, but our regular episodes, when so many people are not being tested? So how much can you trust these numbers I'm saying? Okay, well, I'm gonna answer that uh, the best I can. So the numbers are the numbers. Um, there's and, gonna and be- our numbers are from the World Health Organization, mm -hmm. to be clear, there's There's others. lots of other sites that present numbers that can be either lower or higher than those. We've stayed with the World Health Organization because we're presenting numbers to a large group of people across the world, right? Um, rather than just US numbers. However, um, numbers are numbers, and there's wiggle room in all numbers. And those numbers are derived from tests that have um, accuracy, uh, sensitivity and specificity issues. So the number is the number. Um, we are very confident right now that the number of deaths due to this virus is uh, a, a hard number that we can look at very clearly. That's in most pandemics, that's the number that is most accurate. But couldn't it be quite a bit more because maybe countries aren't testing people who yeah. are dying all the time? Yeah. So depending on and so this gets to the second half of the questioner's question, and, and I appreciate you bringing it up again. The denominator, meaning how many people are actually infected with the virus versus yeah. how many test positive, we don't know how many people are actually infected. We only know the number of people that have tested positive. In countries where we've done some preliminary work, the data suggests that for every positive test we do, there are five to 10 other people infected that we never tested. Right. We won't really know that number, is it five to 10, five to 100? Um, and for every country, it's going to be different because of the availability of testing. So the number of cases we report, it's just a number. We know that it's much larger than that for true infections. Right. We just don't know how large. Um, and so it's a good question. And, and now you, you've kind of got me curious. I, I think about the Spanish flu, a, uh -huh. a global pandemic of 1918, over 100 years ago. And I'm still reading reports in, in distinguished publications that range from 35 million to 150 million for yeah. deaths from the Spanish flu. Um, can you explain the it's discrepancy? A lot of room. It's a lot of wiggle room. Describe the discrepancy. When we give one. ranges like that, we're, we're giving ranges like that based on what we call a 95% confidence interval, meaning that the, the real number of deaths fa will fall between those two numbers 95% of the time. Okay. And we come up with that based on statistical modeling and the best information that we have from 1918 for Spanish flu, for example, or from 2009's H1N1 influenza uh. outbreak. Uh, the data for H1N1 in 2009, we didn't really know it until the Lancet article was published three years later. And we then were able to look at and come up with the number of deaths attributable, attributable to that pandemic. It's also difficult sometimes to explain the difference between mortality to a virus, meaning I died from the virus, and attributable mortality, meaning that the virus likely triggered an event that led to a patient dying. Mm. And we get very good at doing this kind of uh, epidemiology, mostly after the fact. And it won't be until this pandemic with COVID-19 has run its course that we'll get the real numbers. And it's not gonna be a number, it'll be a range like we were discussing before. So right now it seems like the, the trends are almost more important than the actual numbers so that we know which way we're, right. we're headed. What, we're, what we use these numbers right for now is to track when we, are we still in the acceleration phase? Right. Have we leveled off or are we falling? Yeah. And we call them epidemic curves and they are very helpful at determining where a particular city, state, country is in the epidemic. That's why the curves look so different for South Korea versus Italy, who's just kind of maybe peaking right now, and the US who's just going straight up. Right. 
Well, thank you as always for your guidance and thank you for watching.